And he said, and I know thy works and tribulation. Now, uh, I'm going to take you back in my notes just a little bit. Romans chapter 8. And then I'm going to compare it to something that I didn't have in my notes last week. I deliberately left it out. But I think I'm going to make a connection this morning. So Romans chapter 8, verse 35 <clears throat> the Bible says this. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And it's a rhetorical question. And, and the answer is nothing, nobody. No thing and nobody can separate us from the love of Christ. If he loves us, there's not anything that can stand between Jesus' love for us as his bride, as his people, and nobody can stop him, and no thing can interrupt that love. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulations, first thing out of his mouth, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. All of these are pretty bad things. If you've ever been stressed, under stress, distressed, and so on, you know how, how hard that can be to have stress in your life or depression. Anything that burdens you down and that burden won't go away. Persecution, that means Agents of the devil are after us and they are trying to harm us. They're trying to persecute us in some way and it may be in some cases they may want to kill us. Famine, which is something that we have not experienced in this country since the days of the Depression, the Dust Bowl. Um, it would be hard to say how would we would how we would react to a famine simply because that we have not in this country in my lifetime ever experienced that uh, or nakedness or peril. But these are things, these are things that our brothers and sisters in Kenya, in uh, Nigeria, in um, other places, Africa, the Middle East, Asia, India, places like that. These are things that they have dealt with before. Peril or sword. Verse 36, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. And I want you to understand this. Are you ever going to die? When are you going to die? You don't know. You don't know how you're going to die. So he's telling you here, just go ahead and mark it down that you're going to die. And would you rather die an empty death that meant nothing? Or would you rather die for a cause, for a reason, something that you believed in? something that you stood for, something that uh, meant something to you or something that saved the life of somebody else or helped somebody else? Would you rather die that way? Because you're going to die no matter what. You can try to preserve your life and that might work for a while, but everybody's going to die. And that's why he's saying here, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. Me personally... I would rather die doing something for my Lord than to die for any other reason. I would rather die that way. Um, my problem is I'm still afraid of dying. It, there is a natural fear in us of death. But at some point, every one of us is going to die. 
Uh, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels. Now he's going to bring spirits into this. And I'm going to preach on that this morning. Nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, or any other creature. Nothing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, as you know, I count things in the Bible. And I tell you that when you see a list of something, count it. And if you were to start from his, his thought here is, is there anything that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus? And that list starts in verse 35 with the word tribulation. It ends with... Any other creature. And I've counted those things that he mentions that cannot separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. There's exactly 17 things in there. Now what does 17 represent? It represents transformation. Our transformation. When you look in... Um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, that passage about the rapture, the translation, where it says, The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. The next verse is verse 17. And that's where it says, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. That's our change. To me... I could be totally wrong. But to me, this list in Romans chapter 8 tells me that it's probably likely that we will go through all of these things that he said could come against us to try to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. But they won't. None of them will work. None of them will. Now, I don't have this in my notes, so you'll have to turn, turn to Matthew chapter 24. And I know there's differences of opinions on Matthew 24. I know there's differences of, good morning, Jared, how you doing today? Good morning, D. how are you doing today? Good, to, good for you to be here today. Matthew 24... They're asking Jesus about what it's going to be like when he returns. He gives all of these things about uh, kingdom, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, and on and on. Fa he mentioned famines here. That was one of the things we found in Romans chapter 8. But I want you to notice in verse 21... That he says, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. And then he says, uh, then if any man shall say unto you, lo, here is Christ or there, believe it not. And I've made mention of this. I believe God's people, even though we've never seen Jesus a day in our life, when we see the real Jesus, we're going to know it's the real Jesus. And when we see the other Jesus, we're going to know that's not the real Jesus. We're going to know it. It's like somebody who's experienced at recognizing paintings. They can look at a painting and, and say, this is a real this is a real Rembrandt. This is a real Michelangelo. This is a fake one. They can tell the difference. We're going to be able to tell the difference. And now look in verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those. And he mentions days, not years. He mentions days. 
Shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then he says, and then shall appear the sign of the son of man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and then shall they see the son of man coming in the clouds, which is exactly the sign that we're to be looking for. His coming in the clouds when Jesus left. The two angels standing there with the disciples going, this same Jesus shall so come again in like manner. He's coming. We're supposed to look for him coming in the clouds of heaven. He said it in Revelation chapter 1. We have all the Old Testament types. We have in Exodus 16 where the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud and gave the Israelites manna from heaven. In uh, Exodus 19, when Moses gathered together all of the children of Israel to bring them to meet God who, was, who had descended down from heaven, he was covered in a cloud. It was a cloud that covered Mount Sinai and covered God's glory from the Israelites. Okay, So clouds are the important sign. And he says... Then shall appear, verse 30, the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. That's what Paul mentioned. He mentioned it in 1 Corinthians 15, for the trumpet shall sound, the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. He said it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, that the sound of the trumpet was going to uh, come as uh, we're lifted up from the earth and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now, how long does this last? I don't know. I personally do not think that a time span of seven years is what the Bible refers to as the tribulation. I don't believe that. I don't. I haven't read that anywhere in the scriptures. I don't believe it's there. Again, I could be the wrongest wrong person in amongst all the wrong people in all of the wrong world. I could be the number one wrong person ever. So don't trust me. However, would God still be with us? even if we had to endure some type of trial, trouble, and tribulation. Hasn't he already been with you while you went through some trial and some trouble and some tribulation? Has he not been with our brethren in Kenya? In India, in China, in China, the, the state churches are allowed to exist so long as the state church sermons are approved by the government. And those pastors of those churches are sellouts to the Chinese government. They would rather do what man told them to do and get a nice living rather than do what God told them to do. There are some churches who meet in China and other communist nations and communism hates Bible Christianity and they do so at their own peril. There are places where Christianity is illegal. It's not allowed and they suffer persecution. There are nations in Africa where Islam is predominant there are countries where Islam is predominant. And I'm telling you, they do not tolerate Christians. You remember when Obama was president and he allowed the Muslim Brotherhood to do, start a coup in Egypt. And they gained power for a while. And they took all of these believers in Christ. I don't know what church they belong to took them all out to, this, to the beach, got them on their knees, blindfolded them, lined them all up, and one by one went chopping their heads off. You remember that? Huh? They were Coptic. 
But you know what I believe? Those men, knowing they were fixing to get their heads cut off, were calling on the name of the Lord. And I believe that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I would like... I would like to have that kind of spirit in me when it's time for me to get my head cut off. I wouldn't want my head to be cut off. But I'm going to die anyway. My only, again, my only fear about dying is I'm afraid it's going to hurt. It may hurt for an hour, may hurt for a second. But I'm going to die anyway. And I would rather that death be dying for the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, that's what I've asked him. To let me die doing something for you in your name. For your kingdom's sake. That's how I want to go. I may not get that. But that's what I've asked for. So just as a general principle. Even if you don't agree with my view of what is going to happen in the future. We all see through a glass darkly, which means we don't quite all see it the, the right way. None of us do. It would be ridiculous for me to say, if you don't believe my way, you're not going to heaven. I would never do that. But I think it's okay for us to be armed in such a way and have it in our mind in such a way as that maybe we will endure. Because I can tell you, tribulation has a way of separating those who are and those who aren't. Uh, 2 Corinthians 1, turn there. This is what I like about the trouble that I've been in and the trouble that you've been in. Or the trouble that you're going to be in. Some of you haven't had yours yet. It's coming. In 2 Corinthians, here I'm in 1 Corinthians. Yes. You know, sometimes there's just times that you feel like, you know, you may not want to feel this way, but you really feel like God's not there. Yeah. I mean, it's just those times. Yeah. You know He is, mm -hmm. but you just feel like your God's not there. Right. Been there. And you know what that is? It's troubling. And I can tell you who's... In fact, I'm going to preach this this morning. I'm going to tell you who's troubling you. And why they're doing it. Okay? So I'm glad you brought that up. Second Corinthians 1 verse 3. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort. Comfort is a word related to the Holy Ghost and the Scriptures. We through patience and much, we through patience and comfort of Scriptures might have hope. So whenever you see the word comfort, in fact, the word comfort is in your Bible 66 times. 66 books in the Bible. Isn't that neat? Who comforteth us in all our tribulation. That we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Think of comfort as a cup. And God pours in comfort. And you see God pouring in comfort into your cup. And it's getting close to the top. And you say, God, that, that, that's enough. You're, you, God, you're fixing to overflow it. And God says, Yeah. What are you going to do with the overflow? Because what did he say in Psalm 23? My cup runneth over. What are you going to do with all that extra, that comfort that God's poured in there? Give it to somebody else who needs it. Share it with somebody. The reason why we have people in our church who have been addicted to alcohol, addicted to drugs, addicted to lying, addicted to adultery and porn, addicted to you name it. They've been hooked on it or they have been troubled by 
people who hated them. They've had family members that have turned their backs on them is so that when that happens to somebody else, there's somebody in this church who knows what they've been through and who can go to them and say to them, I know what this is like. Up on the list that I have for um, anniversaries in January, it's empty, and it's never been empty before until this year. Jan and Wayne were married on January 1st. And so this is the first New Year's Day that she spent alone. She's not the only widow in our church there are others here who can provide comfort to her who have been through this um, when it comes to my mom still to this day on her and dad's anniversary Melissa and I know to just kind of leave her alone and she spends that day in silence we love her, we pray for her, but I can't help her the way God can help her or maybe the way somebody who has been through this can help her. But rest assured, if I passed or if my wife passed, then one of us will need that comfort on our anniversary. You see how it works? So what good does tribulation do in our lives? It gives us the ability to help somebody else who will go through that eventually one of these days or is going through it now. And he says in verse five, for as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. Did Christ ever suffer? Did he ever suffer the loss of someone that he dearly loved? Sure he did. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring, enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation now why is that word there because there will be tribulations that befall you that are designed to make you to cause you to think I'm just gonna give up on the whole God thing I'm done I'm not gonna live for him I'm not gonna I'm not going to keep doing this. I can't do it anymore. I'm giving up. I'm quitting. And I guarantee you, somebody else has thought that. Somebody else has been there. I've been there. I've been there. And it's been men that I trust, pastors that I know. That have called me or sent me a message. Mike, how you doing today? I got you on my heart. Well, I'm, there's a reason why. I'm struggling. They've been there for me. And it sure helps. So I wouldn't trade any of the tribulation that I personally have gone through. I wouldn't trade that away for all the riches and comfort in this world. Because it's necessary for me to be able to know how somebody else is feeling and what somebody else is going through to be a blessing for them. To show them from the same scriptures that God showed me. Uh, I have people that come to me at least once a month. Somebody else is coming to me saying, Pastor, I've, I, I, I've got this thing in my life. It's sin. I can't get rid of it. I can't walk away from it. I can't. I have, I have no power against it. I, I, I doubt my salvation all the time because Christians aren't supposed to be this way. And I, don't, I just don't know how to deal with it. And I've been there. 
And I will go to the scriptures that God used to show me what he's doing in my life. I'll give them the same thing that God helped me with and still does help me with. Uh, turn to First Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians, whichever one. What time is it? That clock still throws me. Michael, see if you can change that clock to the right time. First Thessalonians 3, 4. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass. And you know, do you know what I have not found in the scriptures? Any verse in the Bible that says, as God's people, we will not suffer tribulation. I've never found that verse ever. Second Thessalonians 1. Verse 3, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, which means necessary, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in, and in all your persecutions and tribulations. He puts those two together, persecution and tribulation, because I think they are connected when you are in tribulation i guarantee you the devil is eating you up and the devil is using people in your life to eat you up to swallow you up to try to destroy you or to try to tempt you in some way to walk away from god to get away from it in other words they're like putting bamboo under your fingernails and they're jamming it in there and they'll say, now we'll stop if you'll reject Christ. Because that's got to be painful. Um, verse, let's see here. Verse, uh, where were we? We're bound to thank God always for you, brethren. Verse 4, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. Verse 5, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. What is the test that God gives us to see whether or not we're worthy of his kingdom? Tribulation. What was the test that God gave Israel? Tribulation. Hardship, endurance. When they got, when they traveled in the wilderness and they got to the point, they're ready to go in Canaan land. They send in the 12 spies for 40 days and the 12 spies come back. The 12, 10 of the 12 says, there's no way in the world we can go in there. Two of them says, oh yes, we can. God made the promise to us. That was their test. Because the Israelites had decided that going into that promised land was not worth being killed and suffering. So they said, let's make us a captain and go back to Egypt. At least in Egypt, we were alive. But they were slaves. They were in bondage under cruel authority. And those people were so wretched in their minds, God having them, given them a clear choice, move forward into the promised land, I'll kill every one of those giants in that land for you. As you walk into the cities, they'll all be laying there dead with flies on them. All you have to do is move the bodies out and take over their houses. They're already built for you. And the Israelites refused to do that. That then connects us to the parable of the seed and the sower. Where when the seed falls on stony ground. It rises up and endures for a while. But because it has no root. And Jesus said when tribulation or persecution ariseth for the word's sake. They are offended and they bear no fruit. They wither up and die and men gather them up and cast them in the fire because they're no good. 
You see what he's saying here? If you can go through hardship in this life and at the end of that still say, I believe Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior and I believe every word in this book is right. If you can go through that, that's called the trial of your faith, which Peter said is much more precious than gold and silver that perisheth. Some people have been offered the riches of this world and they took it. They took the riches because riches means that you have a life of comfort, you have a life of convenience, you have a life of privilege, and any discomfort, you can always buy your way out of it. But then some people have chosen. You know, we feel sorry for some of those saints in Kenya. But the truth of it is, in some cases, they're probably more blessed than we are. Because they've endured hardships and they know how to do it. And Michael made this point when he told me that we found out when we gave each one of them a week's worth of food. They had the wherewithal. They had the. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? They had the experience to know that they shouldn't gobble it up all at once. They would stretch it out to make it last two and sometimes three weeks. Because they didn't know if they were going to get any more after that portion that we gave them. What would Americans do with that? Eat it up, eat, eat as much as we could all at once, throw the rest away. That's what we would do with it. So maybe in some ways, they're more blessed than we are. Because they're better at suffering than we are. Amen? Uh, but then... He said, verse 6, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them which trouble you. God's going to get whoever messed with you. Don't worry, God's going to get them. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed. Look at what he's saying here. He's linking tribulation with what he says in verse 7. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. What day is that? That's the rapture day. Because he said in Matthew 24, he's going to send his angels forth to gather together his elect on that day in flaming fire. You know what that is? That's the fiery trial mentioned in 1 Peter. Taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I'll say this, I've said it before and I'm going to keep saying it. On the days that you're doing well. Remember to pray and ask God to keep you on the days that you're not doing well. Does that make sense? God, while I'm okay. I know that probably by this time next week, this time next month or this time tomorrow. I may not be doing so well. God, hold on to me on the days when I can't hold on to you. I think God will do that. Amen.